you so much for joining us today. This is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. And as always, we're wishing you the best. This, of course, is the natural nurse and Dr. Z. And that's with myself, Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. You can always find out more at naturalnurse.com or Facebook, the natural nurse. Either of those is a great way to connect with us. And also, we love to have you join us in many ways. For instance, on ground. You know, these new words, on ground. On ground means you're actually there with us physically and, of course, online. Now, we have lots of classes, lots of free classes. In fact, today we have a free class on eye health. Do you know how lutein, xanthin, and zeaxanthin can actually help your eyes by decreasing the incidence or possibility of you getting macular degeneration and possibly even cataracts? Well, you can find out today for free by going to naturalnurse.com, click on calendar, and you will find a link to the webinar that we're giving later today. And if you're listening to this at another time, those webinars are archived so that you can actually get them for free anytime. And you can contact me at naturalnurse.com and I can describe to you how you can access. Um, that particular web webinar is really for professionals, but it is 100% free. And if you're somebody who's studying herbal medicine because you want to become an herbalist, well, that is one way that you would be considered a professional. And if, in fact, you are someone who would like to become a registered herbalist, and that is recognized through the American Herbalist Guild, then that is another thing that I'm very involved with. I train people every day and walk them through a very specific process of how to become a registered herbalist. You can take, let's say you're a beginner, you can take a beginner's class with me online, which is called the Natural Nurse Herbal Certification Program. And you can take that if you are a lay person. You can also take that if you are a licensed professional and you get 18 CE credits in fact, for taking that class. And that's for nurses, midwives, registered dietitians, nutritionists, massage therapists, and um, acupuncturists. So if you're not one of those, you can take it just to learn more, to get a certificate from the Natural Nurse Herbal Certification course and use it towards developing your group of classes that you can use for becoming an RH, that is a recognized registered herbalist. So if you think you'd like to bring natural medicine both into your life and also into your profession, then get in touch and we'll set you up with a career consult in natural medicine. So that's one of the things we'd love to share with you today. You can always get in touch at naturalnurse.com or Facebook, The Natural Nurse. Today, we are so happy to have as our guest, Dr. Ken Redcross. Dr. Redcross is a medical doctor who earned his degree from Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York, and he's a specialist in internal medicine. He's also a founder of a full-service concierge medical practice, which we'll talk to him about, which is personal for you specifically. And he wrote a book called Bond, The Four Cornerstones of a Lasting and Caring Relationship with Your Doctor. Hmm, unfortunately, that doesn't sound like most patient-doctor relationships this day, I'm, I'm sorry to say. So we'll see what Dr. Redcross has to say about it. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Redcross. Today, you taught me about being on ground and the difference there. <laughs> Okay, so, so let me ask you this. Um, when you consult with patients, and of course we're going to go deeply into your background, um, do you only do it on ground or do you also do it <laughs> online uh, using a new vocabulary word? I love it. I love it. That'll make it stick in my old brain here, Ellen. So, you know, I prefer on ground. I'm very much an on ground person. In fact, it's funny. <laughs> I had, a, I had a, a house call just yesterday again. Um, and I, it just, it just always reinforces just how much I love, love, love what I do. So I prefer on ground if I can. So, you know, that's interesting because 
you are really modeling, even though you are a very modern doctor and mm. you have access to the latest information and the latest techniques and the integrative techniques, mm. I believe, which is where you're using what's best in conventional medicine, like pharmaceuticals, if they're in, if they're indicated, sure. but along with what we call integrative techniques, where maybe that person needs a massage rather than a drug, and you will recommend that. Oh, absolutely, and you know, I have patients that not only massage, Ellen, but also Tai Chi and other forms, meditation, a lot of different ways to to kind of get to healing that doesn't require my, my prescription pad. So that's the that's kind of the sweet spot for me, and, and a lot of my patients appreciate that. Absolutely. And, you know, there's no reason why you can't actually write that on your prescription pad because I think very often that's what makes people take that step, like the doctor said to do it. Yeah, I agree. You know, I even do that sometimes as a as a prescription for exercise. So I'll say exercise three times a week on the script. And you're right, it just makes it a little more official um, to say, you know, I can keep that on my dresser. It's almost like the doctor wagging their finger at them to, to make sure they go and get their exercise in. Now, doing something like house calls is almost blasphemous at this point in time. And I will tell you, <laughs> Dr. Red Cross, when I was a little girl... We had a family physician who was a pediatrician. By the way, he used to take care of my parents, too, if need be. But right. he, was, he came to the house, and he did things like sat on our bed and felt our pulse and actually could smell if we seemed like we had an infection or that our eyes were miscolored. He spent his time looking at us and our environment. He'd always go over and open the window because I liked it really hot in the room. That's why I live in Florida now. And he was <laughs> right. a believer in fresh air, even if you had a cold or a flu. So he'd actually go open my window in my bedroom. I mean, Aww. this is personalized medicine. No, it really is, and I love that. Look, I'm a proponent of opening the window as well, and you're right, it is. Oh, no, not you it. too. <laughs> I am, I am. We're of the same ilk, that's for sure, because I believe in that also. And, you know, it's something, it's funny. They've done studies on this back and forth. Some say it works, some say it doesn't, but I'm still on with your with your former pediatrician. It's a great idea. And to your point, it is very personalized. Yesterday, as I told you, when I went to make my house call, this person had a upper respiratory issue they needed me to come by and you think it's only going to be 10 to 15 minutes and i'm there for an hour and a half um, but we unearthed a whole bunch of other things um to really help her with healing and health and and the new year and resolutions things that i couldn't get when i was uh kind of in my typical uh medical office that i can do now with house calls so Okay, but also, when you are talking to someone in their house, right, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. means, unfortunately, most people will recognize this. They're in there with the doctor, they're on the table, the doctor's in the corner of the room, the opposite corner of the room, yeah. looking at the computer. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. have seen this happen when I have accompanied patients, and he is looking over his shoulder at the patient. And he is typing. And if he's older, he's looking for these codes because he can't find them and he's <laughs> aggravated and he can't type it in. Is this medicine? No, it isn't. And, you know, it's funny. You mentioned my book earlier about, called Bond. And, you know, and I point out those sort of things. You know, it's a major challenge. You're right. You know, doctors are, are, are faced with those numbers of seeing 20 to 30 patients a day. Um, and with that, they're also trying to do their chart work, their note work. And to your point, find these codes. Um, to put in at the same time, but in the but at the end of the day, you see that there's a patient that's alone that's waiting. I mean, you realize that it's not the personalized care that every patient deserves when they come in and and carve out some time in their day to see us. So you know, it's so important because what about like when you're with a patient, like an old in old traditional Chinese medicine. Even mm -hmm. if you personally have not studied that technique, and I don't know if you mm -hmm. have or not, you may want to because it adds to mm -hmm. your understanding, of course. But I sure. bet you do things like touch your patients and literally smell your patients. There, certain illnesses have, you know, different scents to them. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's good old-fashioned medicine there, Alan. I mean, I, they, don't, they, don't, they don't teach that sort of thing in med schools anymore. I agree. Look, there's healing um, to, to touch 
there's even certain therapies that, that are based on touch and energy and those sort of things. That's the space I love to live in, uh, especially because it's so different, it's so unique, and a lot of patients are learning that there's alternative ways of healing um, that don't always require a pill, but you can also get holistic healing. Um, and I think that's the big difference now than maybe in the, in the past and the way things are changing. You know, and you're using that word holistic, Dr. Red Cross. Uh, yes. Explain to me why, first of all, how the heck did you get the name Red Cross? That's kind of <laughs> like, you know, somebody telling you you're going to be in medicine, whether you like it I or know. not. <laughs> I know, pretty crazy, right? You know, it's funny. I, I never thought about it. It's a Native American last name. Um, the first Red Cross came here in 1787, if you can believe that, or was here. Um, and so it's interesting. I remember as a kid going to a powwow um, and being around it. So you're right. It's like I was already in a, in a, in a spiritual realm, um, being the first doctor in my family. And so it was really unique. I didn't really put it together until I got into medical school, Ellen, and all the professors would get a big kick out of it. Uh, but I grew up with the name. So I, I was like, oh, yeah, I guess that does make sense, you know. Um, but yes, definitely based on my, my heritage and those things that are important to me. I've always kind of had that, um, that spiritual side of healing, wanting to provide more. I'm very much a, a giver and I don't think it changes when you, when you have a patient in front of you. I think they want you to give them your soul just as I want to get into the patient's soul to really get true healing, not necessarily just deal with this one issue that's in my office today that they have a complaint about. So, Dr. Redcross, did you ever go back in time in a genealogical sense and find out if any of your ancestors were, in fact, perhaps native healers? You know, that's funny you said that. Now, we have a family historian, um, and she's been able to go back to some. And so she claims, now, once again, I don't, I don't know exactly, but she claims that there was some, um, some healing um, sort of uh, practitioners um, years ago, but I don't know how she was able to trace that sort of thing, but she said there there was, so she always said, so you're not the first Dr. Red Cross. I said, okay, um, I'm okay with that. So she kind of educated me on that as well. So it, it's pretty fascinating, actually. It really is, because those those heritages are interesting, and, and if you ever want to investigate it more fully, I bet if you had a gene, one of those gene tests, you might be able to track it to several branches in your family and uh, oh, you know sure. I've been doing that with my children because my children have like a, my son says I am the United Nations he says about himself <laughs> because his, his dad is Afro-American his mother's Jewish that's me and so his yeah. roots when he's been tracing them go back to so many different cultures around the world so it's really interesting what you're bringing forward and where that comes from and it's such a blessing no, it really is. And, you know, that's the funny thing about my, my job. I mean, they always say get a job that you love and it doesn't feel like work. And I, I, really, I really feel like I am blessed to be here, to do what I do, to touch others. Um, and I think I've been fortunate enough to do that for almost 20 years. And I, and I hope I'm fortunate enough to do that for another 40 years if possible. Um, because you're right, there, there's something that to be said, at least for me, to, to be able to give and, and touch other people's lives, especially through, through health. Um, it's very important. Now, in your book called Bond, the four cornerstones of a lasting and caring relationship with your doctor, I think this is a very important book, and it's not like there's a million competitor kind of books because I don't think this is really thought about. Can you share with us these four cornerstones? Oh, sure. So, so I, I thought about over the course of my career, as I mentioned, it's almost 20 years now, and, and I've been on the East Coast and on the West Coast. I've been in Puerto Rico. I've been everywhere to kind of, kind of practice and learn, and I picked out four things, four cornerstones that I thought were so important to make sure that patients were happy and were getting high-quality care. And the first one was actually trust. I recognized that once the patients really trusted us, Alan, they were more open. They were more open to sharing some things that maybe would have been something they would have kept a little bit closer to the vest. But when they could do that, I started to realize that our relationship started to grow. The second thing was respect, making sure that they understand that I respect their feelings, making sure that they understand, hey, if they went to, to go online to Google to get information, I respected that they brought that to me because they had other concerns that they want to discuss, and we're going to do that together. The other thing was empathy, 
you know, I think it's really important that the patients really feel that you understand what they're going through, that you can put yourself in their shoes and say, what would you do if there were a doctor in front of you that's, that's asking you to go this direction or to go this treatment option? And last but not least, which, which really brought everything together, Ellen, was communication. You know, wars are started over lack of communication, and it should be just the opposite with the patient-doctor relationship. It should be something to when we are so in tune with one another that we're able to almost know, you know, you're not doing what you're supposed to, are you? Are you still smoking? Are you still, you know, those sort of things. They're all about communication, and those four cornerstones, I find, are incredibly important to make sure you have that perfect patient-doctor relationship. Well, it's almost like the current modern medical system more or less, you know, works against that because so often now we don't have our own dedicated physician. We have Mm -hmm. something that's a group and it's within a plan. And even if you do see the same physician, which is not always the case, I've been with people to clinics, whoever they get, they get, they never saw them before doesn't yeah. matter so there's no yet they trust the, they trust it only because they're a doctor and they say to do such and such but yeah. they don't have a personal one-on-one no and that's not a I, I like the the consistency I think it's really important especially when you're sharing some of your most intimate details about your health with someone that just walks in the room that's taking over for dr. so-and-so today I don't think that's the best way the other challenge that we have Ellen as well is that there's such a volume issue right now in healthcare. If patients, are, if doctors are seeing 20 to 30 patients a day, they're not going to be able to get into the, the patient's soul and the, really what's going on in the, in the seven and a half minutes that's the national average at this point. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons to, to really point as to why that, that patient-doctor relationship is eroding for some people. And, you know, a lot of discussion uh, needs to really be had around that. So that is very big. Dr. Red Cross, because is it true, maybe I'm wrong, but is it true Mm -hmm. that the insurance companies mandate the amount of time a doctor is supposed to be with a patient for a visit, something like five minutes? Oh, no. All right. So the way that typically works, everyone, is that um, lots of times, as you mentioned already, there's a lot of the multi-specialty groups. A lot of the medical groups are together. And what happens is that those medical groups tend to to kind of give directives to the physicians to say that we need you seeing between, as I mentioned, 20 and 30 patients a day. And therefore, your bonus structure, your salary structure, all of that is contingent on the number of patients you see and other outcomes as well. So that pressure gets disseminated down from the leadership of the medical groups typically to let the docs know what they need to make their their salary or their living in essence. So it's not so much the insurance companies there as it is a little bit of the leadership of the medical group to say, we have certain numbers and metrics that we need to meet in order to keep our, our group soluble, in order to keep our group going. And so the problem is, is that challenge between the administration and between the physicians. The physicians are, I've, I've been on both sides to where the physicians are saying, look, we need more time. We need more time to take care of our patients. I don't know the administrators or, hey, we need to see a certain number to, in order to keep the doors open. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to kind of fix that and tweak that along the way, but that's typically the issue, not so much the insurance companies directly, not in that way at least. Well, thank you very much. That's clarifying. So it's not so much the insurance companies, although indirectly it is because they pay a certain amount per service and and the group, even if the doctor, he knows he's getting whatever he's getting, but for him to stay in that group, he has to have a certain level of performance in terms of numbers of patients a day. And that's just the reality. We all do have to pay rent. We all have to pay rent. That's why it makes it so difficult when you're a practitioner on your own. Because when you're on your own and you see a patient, for instance, you may see a patient, you may charge um, $50, and next thing you know, you submit it to the insurance, and the insurance sends you $20. And then you go back to the insurance and tell them, that's not what it costs for my care, and then you send it back, and the insurance will send you $37 instead, and then that's it. There's no more arguing. So can you imagine a doctor off on his or her own arguing this all day long with all the patients that they see and trying to make a living? So that's why a lot of the doctors have to join larger groups 
um, in order to maintain um, their lifestyle and their career. So, you know, it's a challenge. Unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues are, are somewhat frustrated right now because they do want to deliver care directly, um, but they're, they're finding it as a challenge in order to do that with some of the volume um, restraints put on them. And the business, I mean, there is a business end. But, yeah. you know, you are more focused on the healing end. And at the same time, with something like concierge medicine, and let's define mm-hmm. that term since you use it, then sure. patients can have a choice to have a more, let's say, a knowledgeable doctor on their care with a focus on them rather than a focus on the group's bottom line. Yeah, you know, with with concierge care, it's just like uh, concierge at a hotel, everyone. When you go to the concierge, you go to them because they, they know the best places to send you. They give you the top quality care. They provide access, convenience, and time when you need it. And that's exactly uh, what concierge care is. I always say the doctor should feel like a member of your family. And so I, I, I feel like um, I've been able to kind of create that sort of environment, and I think that leads to improved healthcare outcomes that way also. So concierge care is starting to really take off in the United States. I mean, you know, it's no longer a concept that is um, more esoteric or the things that people haven't heard of. A lot of people now know about it. Even um, medical groups have changed their model to try to see what they can do in a concierge sort of um, uh, setup. So, you know, that's interesting. Let me just ask you this. This might be a mm-hmm. little bit of a more difficult question. Obviously, mm-hmm. with concierge, which I think is the way to go, I, I, my own patients, you know, and I'll call them clients since I'm a nurse, not a doctor, so I don't call mm-hmm. them patients. Um, you know, it's that way. There's no insurance reimbursement. Right, right, so right. And with so, your kind and of care, different. could they send it in for insurance or they have to understand there is no insurance reimbursement? That's actually a great question. What I do, you know, it's interesting. I have some patients that I'll see and they're fine. They'll just, just, you know, pay the bill and be okay. But then some I still give the receipts and they submit it to their insurance. And believe it or not, sometimes the insurance will give them a reimbursement back on some of the visits they had with me. Um, so I think it's always ideal if you're looking at a model like this that you still ask for the receipt because you will get some money back on the insurance typically. So you can Not do only that, that so if you a have a high question. enough income, you can also use it as a tax write-off beyond tax a certain deduction. amount. So it is worth Absolutely. having. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. I'm glad you brought that up because that's important. Just so you know, in case you have any, uh, I have a tax attorney friend who specializes mm-hmm. in natural therapies, believe it or not. And so people who are involved in this kind of lifestyle, like some of your patients who might want concierge medicine, you might Mm -hmm. recommend vitamins, you might recommend herbs, you might recommend homeopathics. Guess what? Those can all be listed if you recommend them and can be taken as part of your medical costs, even though they're non-prescription items. And even organic food Save those receipts from Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. They can be all put together as a package, and that starts to add up because it has to be over a certain amount. And they, there's many people who successfully use that as a deduction. Well, now that's something that I learned. See, I told you I always love coming on your show, Ellen. I always <laughs> learn something. That's the second thing I learned today. And that's awesome to know that because that's something that I can share um, especially when you talk about, you know, uh, homeopathy and some of those things. In fact, as we as we touch on the flu today, there's wonderful options in homeopathy that don't require a prescription. There's wonderful things for, for cough and cold that, once again, doesn't require a prescription. And as I talk to patients about that, um, it's really nice to be able to, to mention that there may be some tax benefits there. So that's great. Great to know. Right. Off air, you can ask me, Dr. Redcross, and I'll share with you that particular tax, um, you know, specialist who's a certified public accountant who used to own a health food store and is personally wow. very involved in his own personal health. And he found out this was all legal, by the way. Just like a diabetic, as I'm sure you're aware, has to have a special diet. Sure. 
So the same sure. thing, if you write down that they should eat organic food and they should, you know, get these herbs and they should use this for their flu, like we'll talk about in the next segment, they can share that and, and whatever they spent on acquiring those items with a knowledgeable CPA who can then put together this um, tax write-off deal. So anyway, we're going to take a little break right here, Dr. Red Cross, and when we come sure. back, we will continue our discussion. And I want to tell you, listeners, you can find out more at D or redcross.com that's red cross just like the nursing symbol you know the, the thing on the ambulance <laughs> dr redcross.com he's at your service also twitter at dr redcross.com facebook.com ken redcross md and instagram dr redcross so you can find him and you will be right back with more right here on the natural nurse and dr z On this edition of the Natural Medicine Chest, we'll discuss an herb we all know and love, cinnamon. Ah, the spicy, sweet smell of cinnamon. Everyone recognizes the familiar aroma of this common kitchen spice. But did you know that cinnamon is an exotic plant bark with a long history of medicinal use in many countries throughout the world? Cinnamon was listed as an herb with medicinal properties in Chinese literature as early as 2700 BC. It is described in the Chinese medical text, the Tang Materia Medica, written in 659 AD. Cinnamon also enjoys traditional use in Ayurvedic medicine, the ancient healing art of India. It is mentioned in the Book of Moses and has been cultivated in Ceylon and Sri Lanka since 1200 AD, where much of the world's supply is still grown. In Europe, cinnamon was regarded as a rare and precious spice. Many pharmaceutical substances such as cough syrups and digestive tonics contain cinnamon. It was also used as an incense and in perfumes. According to Chamberlain, writing in France in 1887, cinnamon possesses the greatest antiseptic properties. Cinnamon is gathered from the dried inner bark of the branches of a small tropical evergreen laurel tree. The bark is peeled off and as the pieces are dried, they curl up into quills. These are the common cinnamon sticks that are used in herb teas and for baking. In Chinese medicine, cinnamon is one of the most widely used warming herbs to aid in circulation and digestion. It is a common ingredient in small amounts in tea used for nausea during pregnancy. It is also used following delivery to decrease hemorrhage. Cinnamon raises vitality, warms and stimulates all the vital functions of the body, counteracts congestion, improves the digestive system, relieves abdominal spasms, and aids in peripheral circulation. The essential oils contained in cinnamon include eugenol, cinnamonic aldehyde, methyl eugenol, tannins, and mannitol, which give cinnamon its sweet flavor. It also contains synzenolin and synzenolol, which are both known insecticides. Try putting some liquid soap and cinnamon in a spray bottle and use on plants as an organic bug repellent. Cinnamon is also included in many medicinal recipes that are used for lice, scabies, and other skin parasites. Cinnamon has antifungal, antiviral, and bactericidal activities. It has been shown to suppress E. coli, Staphylococcus, and Candida albicans. So listeners, the next time you inhale that sweet, spicy aroma, Remember, there's more to cinnamon that meets the nose as you reach into your natural medicine chest. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Ellen Kamai, the natural nurse. We'd love to hear from you. Get in touch at naturalnurse.com. Go to naturalnurse.com and you can see our books that Eugene Zamperon and myself have written. There's about 15 of them. You can get on our newsletter list absolutely free. All you do is go to naturalnurse.com, go to the left-hand corner, 
and click there, put your email in, and that's it. We don't ask any other questions. If there's any time you decide to uninvite us into your newsletter list, just get off easily. You just say you don't want it, unsubscribe. And we do send out newsletters with lots of free information, as well as our calendar. And if you go to naturalnurse.com calendar, you'll see all the up-and-coming lectures. We have the Natural Nurse uh, herbal certification course coming up and that starts in March you can join in now if you cannot make the dates that it's given you can actually sign up for it and then we archive it so you can take it anytime day or night that's what's wonderful about all the online webinar webinars versus the on-ground visits that we're talking about today with our guest Dr. Ken Redcross we also have on-ground visits we have offices in Oyster Bay in Deerfield Beach, Florida, and also with Dr. Zamperone in Connecticut. So that's another thing that we do as well. So we'd like to invite back our wonderful guest today, Dr. Ken Redcross, medical doctor from Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in New York. He earned his degree, and now he is a specialist in internal medicine and offers concierge medicine, which he writes about in his book, Bond, the Four Cornerstones of a Lasting and Caring Relationship with Your Doctor. So welcome back to the Natural Nurse and Dr. Z, Dr. Red Cross. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be back. Now, let's talk a little bit about our focus topic for today, and unfortunately what some pe- listeners might actually be experiencing at this point in time, yeah. which is suffering with the flu. Yeah, and you know, it's a big challenge this time of year. Obviously, we know the flu typically starts everyone from October, and believe it or not, it can extend all the way out into May. Last year, it extended out into June. And we know that 45 states right now, Ellen, have widespread flu activity, and we've unfortunately had 24 pediatric deaths as well. So it's important that we're, that we're focusing this year and making sure we do our best to stay flu-free. Now, what, how can somebody tell, Dr. Red Cross, if they have a flu versus something that just might be called a cold? Yeah, that's a great question as well. So look, the the flu tends to come on suddenly. And think about three things, fever, chills, body aches. Those are things that typically don't go with the common cold. And plus, they're different viruses because the flu is caused by the influenza virus and colds are caused by the rhinovirus or the adenovirus, a little bit different. They're a little more mild. But the flu really, really knocks you down for the count and comes on suddenly as well. So... Either way, though, the therapeutics may be the same, I imagine. It's, you know, it's there not like are, a different there, treatment protocol. Well, there, you're, you're right there because there, is, there are some things that kind of link them. The only thing with the flu that is the big, big thing to think about is that the number one complication of the flu tends to be pneumonia. And because of that, that's when you really start to get a lot of the deaths and the morbidity that goes along with the flu. Common colds don't typically cause those sort of things. So that's when you start talking about the treatment sort of changing at that point, Ellen. So they, so, so a common cold then is also – now, are they both viral? Because what I see in yes. conventional medicine is the first thing they do is give antibiotics even though yeah. your mainstream literature recommends not to do that because of increasing the incidence of resistant strains. You're right. You hit the nail right on the head. Both of them, to, to your first question, the cold and the flu, yes, they're both viruses. And so you're right. There is no role for antibiotics there. Antibiotics are only for bacteria, not viruses. So there is no reason to increase your risk for potential uh, complications and side effects by taking antibiotics because they will not help in this case at all. So why is that such common medical practice? Is is there sometimes a co-infection with the bacteria along with the virus that's causing the symptoms of cold or flu? You know, sometimes that can happen to get a co-infection or a super infection, you call it, but it's not often. Usually a common cold does exactly what it does. It just meanders along. It lasts for a few weeks sometimes, kind of have you up and down. That's what it does. But the flu virus in itself is just one that is extremely aggressive, and, is, and it usually really preys on the immune system, especially those 
who are young kids and those who are older adults, such as those who are 65 and older, typically. So that's why the flu is so much more dangerous, obviously, than a, than a typical cold virus um, in which it just kind of gets better on its own. Okay. Now, the flu will get better on its own very often as well, right? Because not everybody gets pneumonia and it gets really serious complications. So I guess it depends on what we call the terrain, like what's going on in that individual as well. Yeah, I love the way you said the terrain, because that's exactly right. You know, it does depend on the terrain of that individual. You know, we had talked before about thinking about, and of course, talking to you as the natural nurse, and you mentioned homeopathy. One of the things that's unique this time of year is that everyone will discuss whether they need a flu shot, what do you think, doc, is this good or bad? But one of the things I talk to them about, regardless of how they feel about the flu shot, is a homeopathic remedy called oscillococcinum. Now, I think you've probably heard of it, Ellen, but a lot of people haven't because the important part is that we know that oscillococcinum decreases the severity and the duration of flu-like symptoms, and we also know that oscillococcinum is safe for kids two years of age and older, and that's important because there's so many things over the counter for kids, Ellen, that they can't really be given to kids that small. But luckily, you know, something like oscillococcinum is something that patients know about and they feel very comfortable with. And so I always love talking about some different unique things that we can do to stay well uh, during this flu season. So that's important. So let's talk about some of the, some of the things because just like with everything, prevention is better than waiting till you get yeah. it and trying to treat it. But once you have it, having something like oxalococcinum around is fantastic. How do you feel about the flu shot, Dr. Red Cross? You know, honestly, I'll tell you, it's interesting. It, it, it kind of comes and goes. In other words, the year when we had the swine flu, which is around 2009, I didn't feel great about the flu vaccine. It wasn't a good vaccine. It was a virus that we didn't at the time know as much about with the swine flu, and people were still getting sick with the vaccine. Now, fast forward to 2018 and to where we are now in 2019, and now I'd say please consider the flu vaccine. Last year's flu vaccine was about 40% effective, And I recognize how controversial it can be, but I will tell you this. We do know that the flu vaccine, especially the one last year, decreased the severity. So if you did get the flu, it definitely helped with the severity of the disease that you actually had or the strain that you had. So that's something to really consider. The other thing is, think about if you have small children in your home or older people in your home to make sure you protect yourself so you also don't spread potential flu to them as well. So just some things to talk about with your doctor each year when it comes to flu vaccine time. So also, it's not necessarily, I mean, you're saying that it might be worth considering, but just because Mm -hmm. you get it does not mean you definitely won't get the flu. Oh, no. I mean, think about this, guys, and I, I guess I should let everyone know sometimes there's between 12 and 20 strains of flu that are circulating at a year. And when we get the flu vaccine, we try to really get the the top three or four and put those in the vaccine. So sure, we can miss some of the strains. They typically are some of the mild strains, at least. We try to get the ones that are what we call in medicine more virulent, meaning of much stronger, and make sure that we try to get everyone um, exposed to that so they can have antibodies fighting that should they see it out in the community. So let's talk about other ways to prepare. Like, are there models of, you know, like hand washing is one yeah. um, that yeah. I know us nurses, they drum that into our head. And I imagine that is something that stops the, the uh, cross promotion of infection. But what can people do from a preventative level to lessen their, like, uh, their ability to catch, you know, if it is caught and is it caught or do you just develop it? in terms of colds or flu, and other natural things they can bring into their life to treat it if they get it. And I always say it's better to have your natural medicine chest prepared because like mm-hmm. you said, Dr. Red Cross, it comes on so fast, so you got to have the oxycoxenum in your night table. You can't wait and go the next day to the drugstore. Sometimes it's too late then. No, you're absolutely right, and it's funny. My kids know when they start to come down with symptoms, they already have the oscillococcinum because I see the little vials lying around when they're done. 
so they already Mine know. Too. So you're right. Mine too. And my yeah, yours too. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I love that. It's like I drilled it into them. They understand. And to your point, you know, one thing we don't really talk a lot about, because you're right, the flu vaccine tends to take precedence, but everyone, hand washing is the number one thing that we should do to stay healthy, to be honest, to make sure that we're not touching our eyes, our nose, and our mouth, and we're infecting ourselves. So what are some other things that we can add to that chest along with the acelococcinum? It's black elderberry. Now, I like elderberry, Alan. I'd love to hear your views on that because there is good data. I like it in tea form um, as well, but there's good data that it decreases the severity of the flu. We know that it helps to boost the immune system as well. So that's one that I always feel good with kind of adding uh, to, the, to the cold and flu season. Well, I definitely could discuss elderberry. I love it, and I like to go pick it myself. I find that oh, every that. part of the tree can be medicinal, the leaves, the flowers in early spring, and, of course, the berries later on. That's the fruit of that tree. But you mm-hmm. are so right, Dr. Red Cross, and there's a lot of very good commercially available mm-hmm. and not expensive elderberry syrups that are widely available on the market. And like you said, there is some excellent science between not only the measurable curative effects of elderberry, but indeed the mechanism of action. So what we know is that elderberry actually does not do much for the immune system. That's not what it does. But the reason people think it does that is on the commercially available products. They Mm -hmm. put immune support. The reason they put immune support is because they're not allowed by FDA regulations to claim what it actually does, which it's, it's antiviral. It is not an immune support herb. It's really Mm. funny. But they throw that word on there to make people sort of get the hint about what they can use it for because of the restrictions. But what we know it does is it does not kill viruses. It interferes with their ability to replicate. replicate. And as you know, as a physician, once you get that infection, that's why it's so fast acting, like you said, with the flu. Once those viruses get into you, they duplicate themselves, you know, millions of times, let's say overnight. That's where elderberry comes in and is so soothing. Plus, in terms of children, like you brought up, it tastes great. So it's not hard to get them to take it. No, and that's a big thing. Obviously, when you're dealing with kids, especially little kids, it's increasingly important, very important. So, so good. So, so black elderberry. Look, I wish I could go out and pick that. I love you saying that. It just, it just brings into that, that, that true nature of, you know, Mother Earth is able to heal us. And so I love the fact that you shared that and actually picking them. I wish I could. I, I mean, I'm in New York, so I don't know if the frost would get them or not, Ellen. But oh um, no, I love it grows that great. Idea. It grows great. This summer, Dr. Red Cross, I'm going to email you. We do an herb walk. It's not too far from you. It's out in Bethpage, New York, a restoration village farm. We spend the day going out, gathering wild edible plants and making medicine out of them. And one of the things we gather is elderberry. There's one in Central Park, in fact. (laughs) You just have to learn. Oh, my God. You have to promise to send that to me. I promise I will be there. I would love to see that. So this, you know, that's the thing. Of course, so many of these things are ancient remedies. But then, like you said, as a physician, you might only feel, you know, supported in recommending them if there's also modern science that documents right. the mechanism of action. And that is true with elderberry. No, it is. And, and you're right. And the, the hard part in being a, a Western-trained physician and kind of seeing the light is that some of these medications that work that are herbal don't have those sort of studies behind them just because pharma's not going to get behind them, there's money issues to get the funding, but yet and still, Ellen, we know they work. We know they've worked for thousands of years and hundreds of years for people. So, um, you know, it, that's, the, that's the tough part about being Western trained and, and so used to seeing the studies, but just anecdotally, we see some things that really work well on the natural side of things. Yeah, how about gargling with salt water? How do you feel about yeah. that? I actually like that. I talk a lot about that as well. I even talk a lot about a nasal saline rinse with the neti pot when it comes to cold and flu season and the congestion that you can get in your frontal sinuses and your maxillary sinuses. Um, so I like that as well. Once again, all natural, easy to do, creates an environment that's very difficult for a virus to thrive in. Um, so I typically like that, that sort of thing. 
I think it's an excellent idea. And I learned that one from my grandpappy. You know, he used to do it every morning when he was shaving. And he just made all of us do it when we slept over the grandchildren. Everybody in here and put oh, tons of that. salt and super hot water. Hey, it can't hurt. And like you you mentioned, a really great thing for cold and flu. And also sinus suffers, Dr. Red Cross, and allergy yeah. suffers because it mm-hmm. gets rid of the particular stimulants that people sure. get in their nasal ca- cavities. And that's called a neti pot. That's N-E-T-I, if anyone doesn't catch that. And that was right from a medical doctor talking about it. It's an ancient Ayurvedic tool. And like you said, doctor, you could also use the more modern saline rinses. Right. And I, but look, and I, and I will tell you this, it's funny. I think, you know, we got too modern with the neti pot. I like the good old fashioned pot. You get over the sink and you kind of go back and forth and eat nausea. It could be a little messy. Okay. I will give you that, but it's going to work so, so I well. Know. So I always I just tell like people the old it's like not one. glamorous. You know what I mean? It's Take not, your yeah. makeup off yeah. first. You might yeah. want, not want to do it in front of your spouse, but it's like yeah. really not. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but if boy, totally. it feels it, that'll show you how much they really love you, Ella. If they stay with you after seeing you use your neti pot, <laughs> that's the key. Oh, okay. That's that's a good marriage and relationship tip as well. So totally. we're going to take a little another little break here, and when we come back to Natural Nurse and Doctor Z right here on Progressive Radio Network, we will continue with our discussion with our very knowledgeable and wonderful guest today, and his name is Doctor Ken. Red Cross, and you can find him at drredcross.com. We'll be right back with more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. Hey, it's Jesse, PRN Station Manager. I have an exciting announcement for our amazing listeners. PRN has a new voicemail line that will allow you to connect better with our hosts. If you can't listen live but have a question or comment for one of our hosts, just call 862-800-6805. That's 862-800-6805. This feature will allow your voice to be heard on your favorite PRN show. Thank you for listening to the Progressive Radio Network. I'm Gary Knoll, the founder of the Progressive Radio Network. Today we have more than 80 producers bringing forth the most progressive and most liberating information, the kind of information you do not regularly hear on any of the mainstream or alternative media. You can help us now. Up to this point, I have virtually supported the Progressive Radio Network, all of its expenses and payroll, myself. But we would like to expand our reach. We'd like to do far more. We'd like to be able to advertise on Facebook and let others know we exist. We are the number one progressive radio network in the world. In fact, we have programs that are most listened to in all of progressive radio. But we could go a lot further. Our message could reach a lot more people, especially at a time when people are desperate for honest, objective insights on the important topical issues of our day. How can you help? It's simple. Go to prn.fm. Go to our main page. In the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little button, Support Now. And then whatever you can contribute on a monthly basis will make a big difference. It will help get the message out. It will help inform more people. It will give them more choices. This is where you'll hear in the independent candidates and the people looking to challenge the corruption in government and the industries. But we need to get our reach out further. So please, whatever you can afford on a monthly basis, and there's some suggestions there, and it'll be automatic. All right, thank you very much for continuing to help us help you and the rest of the world on these important issues.
more right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. And Dr. Redcourse, by the way, does recommend that you do seek medical attention if you have the flu and it gets worse or lasts more than three or four days. Because that is true, Dr. Redcourse. If if you haven't done the natural things or your body can't fight it off, it, it can become pneumonia. And that is the time for the big guns and the antibiotics. We certainly don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. No, we definitely don't. And the reason why, guys, you say, okay, well, why are antibiotics useful now? Because pneumonia that you get from the flu typically is a strep pneumonia. And so that's why antibiotics actually work there. And it's important to make sure that you at least reach out to your doctor so that they know your symptoms and, and prepared for you to come into the office and test you for the flu as well, just in case. So there's room for everything, but so much better to prevent and then treat with natural therapeutics as a first line. But to do that, people have to be educated. And that's why it's so great to get some of these things such as the oxalococcinum, a neti pot, elderberry syrup, all in your home to begin with. How do you feel about vitamin C, Dr. Red Cross? You know, vitamin C is interesting because, you know, there was such a rage with vitamin C and then some studies have kind of walked it back a little bit as far as vitamin C's role. I still like it. You know, I've been really talking a lot about vitamin D and its role as far as immune oh, yeah. support as well. Because everyone Shake, thinks about it only for bone health. Great. But that's important as well to think about D along the way. Okay, so how do we know if we might need more D, or do we increase our D if we have the flu or before? What do you suggest? Well, I'll tell you this. That's what I typically do is I come down and I talk to patients with any sort of flu-like symptoms. I usually bump up my D. The best way is you can actually get a finger stick. Well, actually, you can also go to your doctor's office and get your blood tested. And when you get your blood tested, they'll tell you there's a certain range. They usually say around 30 I like the range to be a little bit higher, or I should say your levels actually be a little higher, closer to 50s, um, to get your levels tested. It's tough. I'm here in the Northeast. We're in a lot, so our vitamin D levels are low. And vitamin D is also not something that's heavily uh, in our diets normally. I mean, it's in fatty fish or the fish livers and things that people may not eat nowadays. But it's something that we really need to think about because it's not only about bone health. It's immune healing. It's also something that may help with our mood as well, we're learning. So, Dr. Redcross, I never heard of what you just said. There's a finger stick test to assess vitamin D status? Um, there actually is, yeah. There's a vitamin D um, test out there. It's a, it's a finger stick. It's at a, at a website called um, NutrientPower.org. Some patients like that because they can get it sent to their home. I think the kit is $99. Um, and when you get the kit, you get it. It's a finger stick. You send it in. You get your results, and you learn a little bit about the uh, about your vitamin D. And you also can be entered into a little bit of a registry as well and kind of continue um, to watch your vitamin D. So it's different. They're doing a lot in healthcare now to make things easier for patients instead of always having to have blood draws. And so you're starting to see that some of these tests for finger sticks are actually coming out. And so it's pretty interesting. That's great. I didn't know that. So you also, however, if you're going to get a blood test by your doctor anyway, can request that they do measure some of your vitamin levels, including D. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and that's one of the things that's important. You know, a lot of us, at least on the Western side, we don't necessarily check as many of the vitamin levels and panels as we really should, especially now that we learn um, back to vitamin D again as far as its, its, its relationship to a lot of mechanisms of actions for a lot of functions for our bodies. Um, magnesium is also starting to really catch a little bit of, um, of fire as far as an important um, um, electrolyte to actually have there or, or, or element, I should say. Um, so we're learning more and more about getting the vitamins checked and really, uh, you know, really starting to supplement them. You know, I really, let me tell you, one of my life goals now, right, I've been doing this a long time, as you know, is actually to bring a lot of these wonderfully documented, according to mainstream medical literature, uh, practices into standard of practice for mainstream. And one of them is definitely vitamin testing, because I'm sure you know almost every pharmaceutical drug interferes with one nutrient or another in terms of status. So why not just, if you're going to recommend a drug, also recommend that nutrient, and that person is often low in it to begin with. It's so inexpensive to do that. 
No, it really is, and, and it's something that you're absolutely right. When you're looking at the, how these drugs work, mechanisms of action, they'll lower potassium, they'll lower your magnesium, they'll lower your zinc. So you're right. It's something that, you know, it, 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 clinically, I think a lot of physicians still, we're all still learning clinically what this looks like in our office. In other words, I mean, is that person who's having muscle weakness, is it because of the antibiotic we started that causes hypomagnesemia and low magnesium levels? Is it something like that? Because we don't necessarily focus so much on what that means clinically. We're, we're kind of dealing, you know, with some of the other bigger issues that bring people in. But to your point earlier, it's about education. Look, I'm educated literally each and every day. Um, on some of the things that we talk about on the more holistic side of healing. And so, you know, you kind of have a thirst for that, too. That's true, and so am I. But one thing that is interesting is that if you're talking about symptomatology, very often the symptomatology, when someone's on a pharmaceutical, actually mirrors, especially when they're getting adverse effects, Mm -hmm. a symptom that occurs because of the depletion of the nutrients they deplete. A, A classic one that many people do recognize is statins. And muscle Mm -hmm. aches and pains, which is directly related to the depletion of the body's ability to create CoQ10. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it's funny because probably CoQ10 and the the myalgias and the things that you get with the pain is probably the first time that everybody gets like, oh, my gosh, I can take a vitamin and feel better. A vitamin and feel better actually clinically makes a difference with a patient in front of you. And so I love CoQ10 in that space as well. But to your point, there's probably several other things, not even probably. We know that there are several other nutrients that can be um, repleted and make a big difference clinically for patients. Oh, there is a big one. So we'll talk about that in another time because we're actually getting close to the end of our time together. Thank you for all your wisdom. Thank you for being a concierge, hands-on physician that really gives their patients the option of getting a lot of care and bonding with their personal physician along with really balanced advice that incorporates what's best and known in traditional medicine, and by traditional I mean natural, along with conventional medicine because they work beautifully together and that compendium really is what we call good medicine. I agree with you, and I'm, I'm so happy to be on the show with you today. And like I said, I always love, love sharing um, all the knowledge that I have and, and pairing that with all the knowledge you have and hopefully changing some lives today. So just give us again how people can find you, Dr. Red Cross. Oh, sure. So my website, um, drkenredcross.com. Um, my Instagram is, once again, at Dr. Ken Red Cross. This is my Twitter handle. Um, and Facebook is Ken Red Cross MD. Okay, well, thank you so much and have a wonderful week. And thank you, listeners, for joining us once again right here on The Natural Nurse and Dr. Z. We'd love to hear from you. Give us a shout out on Facebook, The Natural Nurse, or go to naturalnurse.com. You can email us or call directly. And until next time, this is Ellen Kamai, hoping that you stay healthy. Stay healthy.